Okay, uh, we'll get started for today. And um, so previously we've been talking about how to do yeah, so <laughs> I totally forgot to load it on my Dropbox, so give me a second, I have to get this to work. All right, um, sorry about that. So um, previously we've been talking about if you have a normal data model, that means you have a response that might follow a normal distribution, and then we looked at, okay, if you're gonna use your normal model, you have the mean and the uh, standard deviation or the precision um, as the two unknown parameters. And we started simple uh, by doing either fixing one or the other to reduce to a one parameter model. Okay, so back then we see, well, if you do that, you can actually still get conjugacy. So remember for the mu is, um, mu is random and sigma is fixed, that case the normal will be a conjugate prior for, for the mean, right? And then we did the derivation, we see how that can work out, and then how to do the posterior summary, either through simulation or through um, exact solution. And then we also looked at the case that the sigma is unknown and then mu is fixed. So that is the case that we figured um, if you, instead of working with sigma, you work with one over sigma squared, which is the precision. If you work with that, then a uh, gamma distribution will be a post, uh, will be a conjugate prior for, for the unknown uh, precision. So that will work. And now I want to bring back to um, what we uh, actually started with before, that, well, if you're using a normal model for the data, then essentially you do have two unknown parameters. We only fix them, fix one of them to, to get it like too simple to start. But if you want to make both of them unknown and random, you can actually uh, make inference as well. But then of course, the question will be, how can we give prior distributions for them and then how to do the posterior uh, inference? So that's the topic uh, of today. And then in particular, the way that we, uh, the, the particular method that we learned for doing this is called something, or is something called uh, Gig Sampler. So we will see uh, what it is, how to make it work. And the Gig Sampler itself is under a bigger class of uh, computation methods. Uh, we call it NCMT. Uh, and it's short for, let me write it here early on, triple Markov chain, multi -colo. So multi we've been talking about it um, for a while now, that you can do simulation to approximate the uh, analytic solution. Okay, so we've seen it, well, we know exactly what the distribution is, and then we simulate from the distribution and see that you can get a good approximation to the analytic solution if you have large enough sample size. Okay, so as you can see, uh, MCMC has the second MC is uh, multi -colo. But in order to uh, implement the computation for multiple parameters, which in this case uh, for the normal you have two parameters, we not only need uh, Monte Carlo, we also need something called Markov chain. So Markov chain, if you uh, have heard the term before or you have heard about like sort of stochastic processes, that kind of stuff, um, is more about the next time point is depending on the previous time point. Okay, so T plus one, for example, if you have a unknown parameter to be theta, and then theta one, uh, theta t plus one. If it's one lag, then it's just conditioning, like it's depending on the previous time t. But then if you have multiple lags, you can even depend on further more draws or like draws from uh, from the previous time point. So what we're gonna cover is a uh, one lag Markov chain when we talk about a uh, Gibbs sampler. So you will see uh, when we get there that not only we're using Monte Carlo, so we're sampling from a known distribution, we're gonna learn how to derive it and then sample from that, but also because now we're gonna have two parameters. And then in order to sim like simulate one of them, say for example, theta one, generically, let's do theta one and theta two. Okay, so you will see that when we draw theta one, it's gonna be conditioned on theta two. And then when we draw theta two, it's gonna be conditioning on theta one. And we do this process iteratively, 
So essentially, at some point, say like at the time, uh, like the uh, time t plus one for theta one, it is depending on theta two from the previous time point, but the theta two from the previous time point also depends on theta one from the previous time point. Okay, so essentially, you're gonna get a sequence of draws that follows this Markov chain property because your next iteration depends on your previous iteration. And at the end of the day, we're gonna have sequence of draws that under certain theory will be able to converge to the posterior distribution. And so that's the general um, framework. And uh, the topic is uh, what we focus today. Okay, so don't worry if this all sounds very abstract. Once we get into action in terms of uh, the normal model with mean and sigma, I, I'm sure you will see how, how it does. Okay. All right, so we're still gonna use uh, expenditures in the CE surveys that we, uh, we looked at. So we're still gonna keep working with that uh, variable, which if you recall, that is very highly skewed. And um, in order to properly use the normal model, which of the log transformation, okay, so if you remember, that's what we did. And then this is still the unknown, um, or like the brand, or like say, the random variable that we work with. And our goal now is to use a normal model and then learn about its mean and standard deviation at the same time. Okay. All right, so again, normal distribution, generically, this is what it is. But of course, we, uh, again, just want to highlight the IID assumption. And then it is because we get a sequence of YIs and then they are IID following the normal distribution mu sigma. So you are able to multiply all of the individual marginal density in order to get the joint. Okay, so this, we talked about it, and I think last time um, on Tuesday, the first half or first 20 minutes, we also did um, the exercise of deriving the gamma Poisson um, conjugacy, remember? So at that point, I also said that, well, um, you are observing a sequence of Poisson, okay, and then they're all IID. So that's why you can get the joint from the product of the marginal. So these are actually pretty important concepts. I remember uh, on, Thursday, uh, on Tuesday, we were deriving, um, doing that derivation exercise, some of you just like, ignore the YI altogether, just was doing Y, which is not a good practice. Read the setup really carefully. It's a sequence of Y, and all of them are IID. Okay, and then whenever that happens, whenever that's given to you, then you can get the joint in this way. Okay, so this, we have IID normal, so we have the product, of all of the individual normal. And then that's why you have this YI, the substrate I is pretty important here. Okay, all right, good. So um, this is still the original setup. And we talked about, okay, so this is still actually from previous slide. I just want to highlight some things. Uh, so first of all, we have the uh, data model and then Remember, now if we have this two both as unknown, the likely function is not LU or L sigma anymore, it's the joint, okay? We're assuming both of them are not known. So the likelihood, L, is in terms of mu and sigma together. So this, again, is different from what we used to do. We used to either have L mu when we fixed sigma, or we have L sigma when we fixed mu, okay? And more generically, if I want to model these two together, it's going to be both of them are known. So it's a likelihood function in terms of the two unknown parameters. Okay. That's good. And um, so if we're going to model them jointly, not surprisingly, you probably want to give a joint prior distribution. So generically, I'm writing as pi mu sigma for now. We're going to look at how to do it in a minute. And then ultimately, you arrive on um, equation seven, which is a joint posterior. So as you can see, it's a joint of mu and sigma given all the data. Okay, so this, again, is still the pretty um, basic uh, procedure that we do when we do Bayesian inference. And the things that change right now is about how many parameters you have. Now we have two. If there are two parameters in the normal model, and then the joint, so the, posterior, so the prior distribution becomes the joint prior, the so, uh, likelihood is the joint as well, and then ultimately the posterior is joint. So, so keep this in mind. Right? All right, so this is what we saw so far. So remember, just a heads up, 
that remember equation 10, we took the time to derive it uh, in detail, that if you fix uh, sigma, you get a posterior for mu, which uh, the mean, the posterior mean is a weighted average of the sample mean and the prior mean. And then the standard deviation, the posterior standard deviation is harder to read, so we actually focus on the position, right? And then the posterior position, let me actually just write it really quick again. So position is defined to be one over sigma squared, right? So the posterior position is Bn. We looked at it before. It's the sum of the prior position plus the uh, data position. Okay, so this we saw before. And I think we actually um, talked about the breakdown because phi, say like phi n, going to be larger than either of these two, right? Especially phi n, going to be larger than phi zero, right? So the prior position is larger than, the posterior position <coughs> is larger than the prior position, right? So that translates to one over sigma n squared, which is the posterior no, still the precision, but uh, let's see. Let's do it step by step. So that translates to this. And then, because the, it's the reciprocal, so we know that sigma n is going to be smaller than sigma 0. Right? So this is telling us the standard deviation of the posterior is smaller than the standard deviation of the prior. Right? That's the same as the variance of the posterior is smaller than the variance of the prior. And that's why you see when you plot them together, you have a bigger, like the prior, the posterior is more concentrated. Okay? And that, again, tells us the reduction of the uncertainty because of the data coming into your shop in your group. Okay? All right. And then, of course, we talked about um, all of those terms are known, either from the prior or from the data, so we can simulate it from a uh, R norm function okay, with all of the known parameters. Good, and then of course, uh, just real quick review as well, the particular uh, posterior gamma that we have for the position is here. Okay, so again, all of those alpha and beta, all of the data we know, so we are able to um, generate draws from this posterior distribution using R gamma. Okay, good. So these are the basics. And once we know that, I think we're actually ready to, to move it up to, to both, um, both of them are all known. So the first type, the one that we're gonna focus on, how to specify the prior, is in equation 14. So let's see what this means. So on the left hand side is the joint of mu and sigma, right? Generically we write pi mu sigma. And in particular, in equation 14, we're giving a very special prior that is the product of the prior for mu. So uh, to differentiate, I write pi one. And so pi one mu, and then also uh, multiplying with um, the prior for sigma, pi two mu, or pi two sigma, sorry. So what do you think this equation 14, this kind of prior, what does it mean? So I have a joint. I know I should give a joint prior distribution for these two parameters. And I start simple in a way, especially if you look at 15 and 16, that's exactly what we used to give, right? And this is going to work out very well, but I do want you to, to think about what does this prior distribution mean in equation 14? Or what kind of assumption is making? Maybe I should put it this way. Yeah? Is it that the uh, mean and the variance are independent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one way, even though say, yeah, right now we want to give joint prior distribution for mu and sigma, but one way to do it is I assume they're independent and then I just give whatever I used to give to them, okay? So this is very important to keep in mind that through equation 14, we're assuming mu and sigma 
or independent. Okay. You will see later why this is useful as well as this uh, notion of there being dependent can help us a lot later on when we're trying to do the derivation. Okay. Good, so we assume that they're independent and we're actually gonna go back to what we know before. Uh, in equation 15, that's the prior distribution that we give for mu, okay? And then uh, 16 is the prior distribution that we give for uh, precision, which is one over sigma squared. And keep in mind that they're independent. So if you were to do it, I'm telling you it now, and we're gonna look at it uh, together in the detail, but for now, when you have the independent priors in the way that we set it up in this way, you're actually going to come up with what we call full conditional posterior distribution. So let me just highlight the name and then tell you what it means. So if you look at the full conditional posterior distribution for mu, B is considered as known, right? Just based on the setup. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at the full conditional posterior distribution for B, mu is considered given. Okay, so that's what we mean by full conditional. Meaning that when you're looking at a particular parameter, in this case, if we just look at mu, it's a posterior distribution to start with, right? So the data should be conditional. Okay? And it's conditional as well, so we call it conditional posterior. But it's called full conditional, meaning that any other parameters are being conditioned as well. Okay. For our case, this is simple because you only have two parameters, right? So if you look at mu, phi is given. If you look at phi, mu is given. Sometimes you might get multiple parameters, which we're going to get into later in the course as well. Then, for example, if I have theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, let's say I have three parameters. Okay? So the full conditional, just the form, not the exact distribution. Don't worry about that now. And then the full conditional so for theta one it's going to be the data and then theta two and theta three right so the full conditional is defined to be that you're conditioning of everything in the model okay? so i guess what would be the one for theta two You're conditioning all theta one, and theta, three. Uh -huh. theta one and theta three. Good. And similarly, you're conditioning all theta one and theta two when you're dealing with theta three. Okay. So full conditional is in addition to data. You're conditioning. If you're looking at one parameter, you're conditioning all, all of the other parameters. Okay, so keep this in mind. And I should also mention that, remember, we have been talking about, well, if something is being conditioned, you assume that you know it, so it's a constant, right? So once you assume you know something, it's constant, then the derivation becomes much simpler. So that's the recurring theme that I think we have been seeing. So now I actually want you just to try that now I'm giving the joint prior distribution is in 14, and I tell you the prior for mu and the prior for 1 over sigma, how can you derive 17 and 18? I should also say 17 and 18 are what we have seen before. They don't change at all. Can you convince yourself that this should be the case? Okay. So take some time. I will walk around. You can start sketching things. I think like just also try to like write it down and then play around the terms a little bit instead of just thinking. Because uh, sometimes when you write things down, it's much easier to see how things play out. Okay, so my, my hint again is we're using the same prior, 15 and 16 as before, for mu and sigma, uh, 1 over sigma squared. And then in 14, we just talked about we're using independent priors for mu and sigma. Okay. 
And lastly, I want to mention in 17 and 18, these two equations, when we define full conditional, it means that the for mu is conditional on phi. So when we talk about conditioning, it's constant. Okay? And then equations 18, similarly, when we talked about one over sigma squared, mu is being conditioned. So mu is considered as a constant. Okay. So once you think that, you might start to be able to cancel out terms or throw away terms from the prior. Okay, so maybe let me just do one more thing for you so you can, can, you can see what it is. So the likelihood now is written in terms of mu and sigma jointly, right? Mm -hmm. That's fine. So we know by base rule, the joint posterior should be proportional to the prior, joint prior, and the joint likelihood, right? So you still perform similar things like you multiply, you get the terms right into the correct locations, blah, blah, blah. And then from here, think about how you can get 17 and 18, okay? Again, as you can see, the forms in 17 and 18, I wouldn't ask you to do all of the derivation again, but rather you should convince yourself how come what we used to do when we fix one and let the other one to be random, actually the results are the same. Okay, so that's my hint. And also key I wrote down here is the prior is independent. So think about that and I will walk around. Now, uh, this helps you in the future, say if you see multiple parameters in the model, how can you most efficiently derive the full condition? Any thoughts or approaches? Maybe I can ask, how does independence help us here if we know that they're independent in the way that we're doing it in equation 14? Do one more step for you. So here. So L mu sigma, those are from the likelihood. So you're still going to keep from the normal curve. That's fine. How can we do pi mu sigma now? It's pi 1 mu and pi 2 sigma and then L mu sigma, whatever that is, right? That's fine, right? Because we are doing independence and then we actually put um, two different priors, 15 and 16. Those are the priors that we used to give when we fixed one and then let the other one to be right. Okay. So this will be the product, and then you will start to recognize or like derive the full conditional from this product. Okay. All right. So maybe I would do like let's see. Do you, do you want to do the demo for mu or sigma? We can do whichever. Mu would just be more complicated, but it's the same stuff. Which one do you prefer? Yeah. You. Yeah, okay. Do the heart thing. Yeah, right? Okay. All right. So, you know that mu sigma, the posterior, is proportional to the prior, joint prior. So, joint posterior proportional to joint prior times the likelihood. And it's joint in a sense as well because both are unknown. Okay. And what I just did for you is pi one mu and then pi two so sigma and then the likelihood. Okay. And then I said now you will get the terms 
from here to get your full conditional. Okay, because that's the posterior, that's the joint posterior. So what do we have? Full conditional by definition is uh, let's see. For mu is mu given y1 to yn and phi. I mean, it's sigma, but really it's phi, and we're going to work with phi. Right? That's the full conditional distribution that we define. Okay? So, what it is? Let's do this thing trying to get the distribution. So, first of all, it's, it works very similar to what we used to do when we derived the posterior. So, first of all, in this bracket, I mean in this box, because phi, the same as sigma here, is being conditioned. So we assume that that is known and that is a constant, right? For mu, because now I'm being I'm conditioning phi here. Right? So that means, well, yeah, like the pi, for example, pi, pi two sigma, yeah, from this gamma, you have all of the terms. But it doesn't really matter because it's not uh, any terms related to mu. I only focus my mu here. Right? Mm -hmm. So what matters? Pi 1 mu, right? That's the prior. And of course, in the likelihood, the mu matters. Because mu is going to be inside of it. Right? All right, so what it is? Remember that's just what uh, mu zero and sigma zero. So for the prior, and I think it's it's b zero to one half, right? That's yeah, I think so. Yeah, one half. That mix p is what mu. So it's mu minus mu zero squared divided by two, and then you multiply the p zero because it's divided by uh, sigma squared, sigma zero squared. Right? That's just the density from the normal. Now tell me if I make mistakes. It's possible. I, I don't remember like all that in detail. What about the likelihood? The likelihood is one i from one to n, right? Because we have jointly n of them. So again, it's g pi square a square root of this, and then it's the data v, so it's that, and then. yi minus mu squared, right? And then c. Right? Uh -huh. So one more thing we can do, obviously, is to um, extend the product term. I think it's actually a practice to do it early on so we don't get confused later. So we do that. So you still have whatever the prior and in the likelihood is one over square root of two pi raised to top n b raised to n over two. So just do it step by step, like don't no rush. And then lastly. Xe is negative the sum of all of the yi minus mu squared. Right? So this product, all of the uh, exponent, so within it is going to be the sum, and the sum is being applied on the y's. And you, you probably start to realize it's nothing different from what we used to do, right? We get the prior, which is a normal uh, mu zero, sigma zero, 
And then the likelihood, I mean, likelihood again, it's expressed in terms of mu and sigma even in the first place, right? Even if we fixed sigma in the first place, it's still expressed in this way. So I, of course, will try to avoid all of the work now. So I wanted to highlight to you what we can ignore. So again, we care about the unknown mu, okay? Everything else is given. So what can be thrown away? Constant, right? This constant as well, from the prior. That, of course, we'll have some terms about mu and mu squared. Goes away, right? And in fact, this term goes away as well. This phi is known. So full conditional, again, the definition is, if you're looking at one particular parameter, the full conditional posterior distribution is the conditional distribution of the unknown parameter, given the data, and every other parameter. So now we're left with what? This and this. Okay. And this again are exactly what we did last week. Okay. So the only big difference I should say is we do have this, those terms now in, but this again, because you assume phi is given by definition of full conditional posterior distribution. So you're only left with this two. And this two, of course, involves some um, complete of squares, blah, 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 but you get the same results. So that's why we don't even need to redo the derivation. You can just get equation 15 from what we used to do for a one parameter model. So I will pause for maybe like two to five minutes-ish. And I just want you to try to sketch a little bit to see how come that when you're trying to do phi, even y1 to yn and mu, how can you cancel those terms and then recognize that, well, it's, it was exactly the same thing that we used to do. Okay, so key point, Make sure that you know they're independent here. And what is constant now? The constant is mu. Okay. So all of the terms about mu can go away. So I guess I should also say the gamma, what is gamma? Gamma, gamma density. So if something has gamma, And the density is e to the power of a, gamma a, and then the unknown to the power of a minus one, I think, and then okay, so use that. And just as I was writing, I realized, I guess, in last week, what we were doing is, I wasn't using P0 and C so much, right? I was using one over C squared, but it's the same thing, okay? So convince yourself that's the same thing, and then you can work from there. So I'm gonna pause here. So the task is how to derive this by borrowing what we already know. Any progress? Do you see how we can get that posterior, uh, not posterior, full conditional, full conditional posterior in a straightforward way? So I will just try to do that and we will erase some stuff over here and then replace that with whatever you write with the gamma. <laughs> Thank 
So as you can see, as you say, the important um, skills you have from this course and also doing Bayesian inference is being able to think through the different parameters in the model and then given what the prior distribution that you give for each parameter, sometimes jointly, sometimes separately, like what we're doing right now is separately. So you should be able to derive what the full conditional distribution is. Okay, and as you can see, the derivation procedure is no not very different from what we used to do when we we're doing the posterior. Okay, so the key is to understand well what is constant here. How can I use that efficiently to avoid too much more work? In a sense, that's what it is. Okay. So let's do this quickly. So we want to get the full conditional for phi, right? So the mu is being conditioned. So that means the pi one mu. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Right, so pi two sigma. Yeah, sorry about the notation. I just realized when I started writing, I was using phi and sigma, but it's it's the same thing. Okay, and we're putting the gamma on phi. Okay, so I'm still writing this way, but it's it's the same thing. Next time, I'll make sure that I don't uh, create more confusion here. So what do we have here? The prior for phi, which is um, the gamma, will give us b a. And then gamma a, and then c to the a minus one, and then p minus two, p, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'll do this quickly now with the joint. So it will be one over two pi square root, then p to the power of one over two, and then p negative. 2yi minus mu squared and then b. Right? So quickly I get to so again, depends on your preference. I personally like to get the product out early on so I don't get confused later. So I'm doing this way, but you can sometimes some people want to start canceling, like throwing away the constants. Immediately, that's fine as well. So up to you. I'm just demoing uh, one way that you can do it. So when i expanding the product, OK. Now, canceling those constants, this goes away, this goes away, and that's it. Everything else is about C, right? And this again, you can just read it now. It's pretty much like, remember the sum of this two and the sum of this two, and that's the full conditional posterior distribution. And it's exactly the same. When we fix the other one, as known, and then do the rest. Okay. But I do want to mention that there are still like key differences between between what we're doing now and what we did before. So let me bring back to the slide. The key difference, so even though eventually we come to the same, roughly the same, I mean, previously the uh, posterior distribution now is something called full conditional. Even though we come to the same term, in 17 and 18, they're different from the beginning. So previously, uh, last week, when we did um, fixing one and then letting the other one is unknown, then the other variable never really comes into play in any of this, right? Everything is given. It doesn't come into the prior. It does not even come to the com uh, come to the likelihood, et cetera, et cetera. So, Say when mu is fixed, when sigma is unknown, we just assume mu is fixed. Here, we are actually trying to model both mu and sigma, or mu and phi. 
And we're doing it by doing an independent prior in 14. Okay. So these are different. Now we're assuming both are unknown. But we sort of like taking a shortcut and doing this in a easier way that we're assuming independence between the two priors. And we're actually using the same prior as before when we are doing one parameter model. Okay. And then when we come to equation 17 and 18, or like before coming to equation 17 and 18, we first of all talked about the definition of full conditional posterior. Okay, that's when you're looking at one unknown parameter, the full conditional posterior is that parameter given everything else. Okay. Everything else including the data and every other parameter in the model. Okay. And same for mu and same for p. And that helps us to actually use whatever we already knew about if you fix mu and only let sigma to be random or vice versa, those posterior distributions actually will be exactly what you see in those full conditional posterior distributions. And that reason is because you are conditioning, by definition of full conditional, you're conditioning any other parameters. Okay. So it's still totally two different approach. And you will see when we move to the next few slides how the computation is going to be different. Because now, obviously, you see that mu is random and phi is random. Right? We know something about this full conditional distribution, full conditional posterior, but as you can see, we have this full in front of it. It's not the posterior. Okay? In order to get the posterior now, from this full conditional posteriors is what I caught earlier, I was introducing earlier, doing this Markov chain Monte Carlo. Okay, so Monte Carlo again, I mean, now we know the distribution, right? So uh, suppose, okay, so let's look at equation 17 for now. If I want to sample mu, what can I do? Mu zero, I know, right? Mu zero, I know. It's from the prior. N, I know. It's from the data. Y bar, I know. And it looks like the only thing I don't know, even though we're doing, like, we're conditioning on it, but we don't know the values. Right? So once we know phi, we're able to draw mu. Same for equation 18. Conditioning mu, meaning that, so all of this again are known because these are from the data and these two are from the prior, right? So that means as soon as we know this, we can sample P, okay? In equation 17, as soon as we know this, which are the same, I can sample mu. That makes sense? Okay. So now, in order to get a good approximation to the posterior distribution of mu and phi, what we're going to do is, first of all, Monte Carlo, we're still going to draw from like this will still be R norm, right? And this will still be R gamma. Another thing we need to do is we have to do this iteratively, meaning that, okay, I first want to get a mu. How can I get a mu? I first need to give a number for p, right? So you can give an initial number, like say any number you can think of, that's fine. Say like say just one, for example. So if I plug in p as one, I can get a new draw from mu, right? And that draw, in a different color, that draw immediately is going to be used for my next step of drawing Right? So in order to get an actual real draw of C, because we initialize it with a random number, and in order to actually make a real draw of C, you use the draw that you have from mu, plug that in, and do R gamma. <coughs> right? 
and then I, I can keep drawing. I would just keep drawing it in an iterative fashion that I get a fee from you, and then I use the new fee to get a new mu, and then keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay. So this process is what we call the sampler. That I have full conditional distribution, full conditional posterior distribution. I can derive them, as you can see. Equation 17, 18. Great, I can derive them. So as long as I have some initial value to star, I'm able to draw like a sequence of fees and a sequence of mu. Okay. Whether those sequence, the two sequences will be good approximation to the posterior, we're gonna talk about it, but at least we can do it by doing this iteratively. And that's the Markov chain. So Markov chain I was saying earlier is whatever the next time point is depending on previous time point. Right? This time point you can think about iteration. I do this now, say I get mu one. Then I can get so I get an initial value for B, I get a mu one. From that mu one, I can get C1, and then C1 to mu two, and then blah, 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 blah. you can do it many, many times. Make sense? Good. So how to do this in action? So I actually set this up for you so you can read it later carefully, but I was talking like about this uh, idea already. So there are multiple ways you can do it. The one that I demo over here is that you say you have initial values or starting values for both of them, and you label them as zero iteration. Okay. And then you can start whichever you want to start first. That's fine. Whether you want to draw, so this is original equation 17 and original equation 18, right? Whether you start with 17 or 18, it's fine. Whichever is fine. But then generically, at one iteration, <coughs> what you do, for example, if you're going to start with 17 first, so for mu s, you're going to use the draw of phi s minus 1. And then for phi s, you're going to use the draw of mu that you just did. And once you complete this, you get a set of the two parameter draws at iteration s. And then you do it for a large number of times. And I should also mention that these samples are dependent, right? Even though it's not immediately dependent. So, v, so like my, so for example here, my phi s is depending on mu s, and then mu s on phi s minus one. So these two are still dependent. Okay, so that's what we mean by a dependent sample. And later you will see that how can we make them independent? Because eventually, remember Monte Carlo is that you have to do independent draws to ultimately summarize the results. So we need a way to get rid of the dependency across the iteration. We're going to talk about it, so don't worry about it now. But I do want to highlight that we're doing this through a give sampler. And give sampler, if you run S large enough of times, you're going to get a sequence of mu's and a sequence of E, right? They are dependent draws. They're not yet independent. Eventually, we want to get them independent. At least we have draws for mu and phi separately, and those are the ones that we're working on in terms of summarizing the posterior. Okay, so I guess a lot of uh, lecturing, but I do want you to get a get a try. So this is the um, deep sampler code that I wrote for this particular um, setup. I will explain this a little bit, and then I ask you to do a um, couple of exercises. So the way that I'm doing right now is I wrote a function, and I call it give sampler a give underscore normal. Okay, so that's the give sampler for the normal model. And for a functioning R, you have 
whatever input that you have. So for me, I, I will, like, so you see that the input is down here. I'm going to initialize those. And then also the number of iterations I'm doing. Okay. So let's go into um, inside the function right now. So this, again, is from the data. That's OK. Y bar is just like, say, so here, as you can see. So let me talk about the input first. So the input, I have a few things. I have the data, which I recorded in Y. Remember, it's the CE data, and then it's the log transform total expenditure loss quarter. Mu0 and sigma0, those are actually the priors that we used to do. I'm just going to use the same for the mean. Okay, So these are the prior mean and prior standard deviation for the unknown parameter mu. Okay. Alpha and beta, suppose I'm giving gamma 1, 1 as prior distribution for the um, precision parameter phi. And then as you can see, I only initialize uh, from phi. I'm just going to start with phi as 1. Okay. So you're going to see how to use this later. All right, so this is my input. So y bar is the sample mean we needed because we need to use this to sample the posterior, like the full conditional, I should say, because that comes into play in equation 17 and 18, right? So I initialize that. I also get n, that's the number of observations. I need that number as well, because that comes into play, I think, in both equation 17 and 18. And typically, you can initialize a matrix to save the parameter draws. So I call it para. It's a matrix. Each element is zero now. Okay. And I have the dimension. I have S rows and two columns. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is I'm creating an S by two matrix that when I run one, so you see that there is a for loop coming up. So what I'm doing is I initialize this matrix and then I'm saving like a set of draws, one mu, one phi, into each row as I progress. Okay. So that's why the number of rows is s. That's the total number of iterations I will be doing. And the number of columns is 2, because I have two parameters. And then I initialize the phi, value of phi, from my initial value of p with a phi, which is one down here, as you can see. Okay, so with all of this ready, I can start my give sampling. The way to do it is to write a loop, okay, a for loop. And I'm looping, so I'm using the index as s, and then s in one to capital S. That's the number of iterations I'm doing. Okay, so what I do, well, mu one. Old friend, we did this before, that was previously done when we were doing the lab, which it was doing today. Right? It's the exact same formula that we did. And we're using the same formula because the full conditional posterior distribution is the same as the posterior that we derived earlier. Okay? So I get mu1. I name it mu1 so later I can save it. And then sigma1. It's from, I should say, mu1 is the mean, updated mean, for the full conditional posterior mean. And then this is the full conditional posterior standard deviation. Okay, so these two are from what we did in lab two. Right? So with this two, now I'm able to update my mu because my mu follows that equation 17 which is a random draw. I only draw one because I only need one with the mean mu1 and standard deviation sigma1. So now I have my mu, which is a new draw for mu at this particular iteration s. OK. And then I move my, so this again is equation 17. Then I move to my equation 18. That's to update the phi. The way to do it is remember we have updated alpha. I name it as alpha 1. You can name it as whatever you want. That's totally fine. 
and then beta 1, which is the updated beta. And then for phi, we know it's a gamma. We do one draw only, and the two parameters that you need. So the names of the parameter, one is called shape, one is rate. So that's why it is. So what we have now, and in this iteration, we have a mu and we have a phi. Both are updated. Okay. And I should also mention, as you can see here, let me use a different color. It's important to realize this mu was exactly what I just draw earlier. So that's pretty important. So remember, we're doing this iteratively. So as soon as you draw a new mu, this mu should come into play when you draw your phi. Okay, so that's the key. Sometimes it's um, easy to miss. And then I have a new draw of mu, new draw of phi at this particular S iteration. So I save it into my matrix of my parameter. So that's the understanding of the function. And then in the end, you can just run this function at the bottom. The function name is Gibbs underscore normal. The input is from the previous line. And then the number of uh, iterations. Yeah, I should say like number of iterations. You can change it later on as well. Sort of making sense? I mean, just you have to do it like so you know how, how it works, but that's the explanation I think is uh, useful to think about what this does. So what I will ask you to do is, I mean, we don't have much time left anyway. So this is like summarizing. You can go back to this later. I do want you, hopefully brought your laptop. I do want you to understand the code um, better by doing these two exercises. So the first exercise, we can continue on Thursday, uh, on Tuesday, of course. So the first exercise is, remember, in the sample code here that I copied and pasted here, we were initializing the fee, right? We start with the fee. So try to initialize it with a mu initially. Okay? I think that can help you to get through which part of the code you need to change. And I think that actually helps you to understand the code better what the code is actually doing. I did like a quick explanation, but you really have to go through it step by step. And the second is, exercise two is, oh, what if I want to initialize both of them? Both of them? Okay, so you can also make some trick to this change. So I would recommend you to say like, so I did post the R script on Moodle, so you can download the R script, get that portion of the uh, sample that I have over here, and then start a new section for exercise one and another section for exercise two, okay? We don't have like five minutes left, so I will walk around and uh, help you understand it, but then on um, Tuesday when we come back, we're gonna continue this for, for a while before we move to talk about uh, the important aspect of how to make those draws independent, right? So earlier, we've seen this, even though you do give sampler, great, <coughs> you do really great, but you end up with dependent samples. But in order to summarize the posterior, or I should say, in order to have a good approximation to the posterior, you need independent draws. So we're going to go into the detail of how to get independent draws out of the dependent draws that we have. Okay. So I think I will, yeah, I'll stop talking here so you can explore the code a little bit. And then I'll walk around to answer questions that you might have. And on, third, on Tuesday, when we come back, we're going to spend maybe like 10 minutes, 15 minutes on this at the beginning. And then we can carry on. So I highly recommend you definitely try it before, before, we, uh, before we meet on Tuesday. Otherwise, it's not as helpful as it could be. Okay.